everybody, Ziv Simon here. I'm the creator of Surgical Master, and today I'm on the line with Dr. Itzhak Binderman from Israel. Hi, Dr. Binderman, how are you? Fine, I'm fine, and to see your smile, it's a, it's a good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, it is for me, and a happy and healthy new year to you and everybody else. I must tell you that I listen very much to your webs, yes. Surgical master, <laughs> they are very, very educative. I mean, educating people, and uh, more and more we need it. Thank you, I, I really appreciate it. And Dr. Binderman, you were my professor 25 years ago, back in Tel Aviv University. I don't know if you remember me. It's a right claim. <laughs> 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 okay, it's been a long time, and you've been, uh, you're uh, at the Department of Oral Biology at Tel Aviv University. Uh, you've been involved with dental implants, with implantology, with bone research for well over 40 years. Uh, it's right. almost as long as I'm alive. <laughs> so uh, you, you, in my opinion, are the best person to ask about many of the burning questions that we uh, in the dental field have and a lot of doctors that I work with in the surgical master community and in the world are very curious and have some challenges when it comes to preserving bone for an implant site. And I wanted to ask you uh, some very definitive questions about these issues. So uh, can we get started? Sure. Okay, wonderful. So, um, as a clinical observation, uh, all of us see that once the tooth is extracted in any part of uh, in the oral cavity, we are seeing bone resorption. So, the first question is, why do we see bone resorption? And a segue to that is, why do we typically see resorption of the buccal plate and not the lingual or palatal plate? Well, that's a burning question today, because what we see is, of course, that uh, after a while, after extraction, we see that uh, we lose usually the buccal plate, and this is also a problem, an aesthetic problem, not only a functional problem. And this is because, and I, I was thinking about this question for, for, for a few years, and especially the, uh, now because uh, it's, a, it's a problem really to restore the buckle plate. So what we have to, to, I mean, to remember, or to get to remember what we learned in the school, how teeth erupt. Teeth erupt essentially from inside outside. And when they erupt from inside outside and up or down from the upper, then, this is when the buccal plates are essentially uh, developed. Okay. So the mostly the buccal plate is mostly alveolar process. It's not really a basal bone. On the lingual side, we have support more of a basal bone. And, and only the, the volume of the width, essentially, is essentially alveolar bone. And this is why it's a functional bone. When you now extract the tooth, the functional bone disappears. It's not strained by, by, by the periodontal ligament anymore. And this is why we lose the buccal plate. Mm. Okay. And this is really our main job, how we can preserve it. And then if not, how we can restore it. So th thank you for that, because uh, I wish I'd asked you this 20 years ago, because uh, I thought I, I, I saw this, and we all see that the buccal plate is the one resorbing. Now we have uh, a great explanation. So thank you. Thank you for that. So is there a chance to be able to preserve the original bone volume as it was when a tooth was there. Is there even a remote chance that that can actually happen? Well, this is the challenge of our profession all the time. Okay, we're fighting it also in periodontal bone loss. 
In the last 20 years uh, in my lab, working together also with another professor, maybe you know, Abinoam Jaffe, okay, from yes. Jerusalem. Yes, he's also a perio in, in prostodontics. And we found essentially something which is neglected by dentists. And this is the attachment of marginal gingiva to the root. Now we found that once this attachment, we lose this attachment, then cells which are in the marginal gingiva, cells, they send a, a signal to alveolar bone loss. I mean to alveolar bone resorption, okay? Now, if we want to restore, for example, even a periodontal defect, okay, I believe that if we can reconnect back by biological connection of the, of the cells and the, and the attachment of the marginal gingiva to the root or to even to the implant, we can maintain the bone underneath. Are you, Even, are you referring to so the junctional we, we epithelium? Oh, sorry? sorry? Are you referring to the junctional epithelium that is basically destroyed when we extract the tooth? I'm, I'm referring to the, essentially, to the free gingiva, to the papilla. Okay. I, I can tell you a, a very short uh, study that was done by uh, a dentist in uh, Germany Gomez Roman, and I will do it very fast. And what he extracted, uh, he, he did implants, and uh, single implants in the, in, the, in the anterior part of the maxilla. And when he, he, he did two kinds of surgeries, and this is something which clinicians say, should, should I mean, uh, hear this, this study. Uh, he did, once, he had to do one single implant in the front part. So what he did, he did two kinds of surgeries. He cut under the papilla a flap and did the implant, or he cut through the papilla, disconnecting the papilla, not only the papilla, also the marginal gingiva, okay, to the root surface, the sharper fibers to the root surface. And he measured the resorption after time. He found that he, he had a lot of resorption when he essentially cut the, the, the connection of the papilla to the root, okay, and the marginal genome. Once he did the surgery under the papilla and left them, yes, then at this point, he had a very low resorption rate. He couldn't explain, but uh, our studies did explain it because when, when we cut the dental gingival fibers, we always lose bone. Sometimes it's reversible and usually it's not. And, and, and that's so interesting. And what, what are the, Dr. Binderman, what are the, implic the clinical implications of a study like that? So how can we now apply it clinically if there is something first like all, that? First of all, this every clinician that does surgery has to understand that the papilla and the marginal gingiva connection to the root are essentially the most important protection of the bone underneath, not the periodontal ligament. Okay, this is how it starts the periodontitis essentially. Okay, now, if we now want to build, for example, bone, okay, if we are able, if we will be able, and I'm sure in the future we will be able, yes, to attach the marginal gingiva after grafting, okay, or even after extraction, to attach the marginal gingiva biologically to a, an implant, Yes, then this, this bone buckle plate will survive. Hmm. Okay. 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 That's because amazing. The buckle uh, plate uh, is right? part of the marginal gingiva. It's the periodontum. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the papilla 
and the free gingival margin or the marginal gingiva are the most crucial. So clinically, if we can do anything to avoid damage, which we also see clinically, uh, that would obviously give us a better chance. Now, what do we do when we have an infection, uh, because let's say a vertical root fracture, and yeah. the buccal plate is already gone? What mm -hmm. would be the best uh, clinical and scientific approach to address it? Because many times I find that if I don't reflect the flap, I can't clean it out, I can't restore the defect. So what would be, what would be your approach? Yeah, that's, of course, the <laughs> most important question now, the challenge, again, of dentistry. Now, so we have, first of all, we have many, of course, grafting materials today. And some are the synthetic are excellent because they, they grow fast bone, okay? Uh, but our problem is not to build new bone, you know? Many years ago, I think Linda have shown you put a membrane and you get underneath a lot of bone. Why we need a graft at all? Was the question. Because he found that after a while this bone disappears. It is resorbed because it's not a functional bone. It's not part of the host. Okay? And you don't have something which is act making it active. So then we started to use together with some bone graft materials, of course. Now, it's a lot, we have a lot of selection of bone graft materials. So as I said, some are excellent synthetic, like calcium sulfate, as an example, it will produce bone, fast bone, and uh, we know it for maybe 50, 60 years. And they used uh, uh, gypsum for, to, to graft. And, and it, but again, it dissolves disappears. So the bond also disappears. Mm -hmm. So we need a graft that will be, first of all, also bioactive on one hand, but it will be remodeled very slow. And it will be also that the new bond that is formed on it is like in ankylosis of a root, which means, and this is, a, uh, I, I would put it this way, uh, what is the difference between ankylosis and osseointegration? In osseointegration, the bone is built toward the biomaterial, it's an implant or whatever, okay? Or like in bios. The bone is built toward the material. Sometimes it's very close and sometimes it depends on the material. The titanium is excellent, so we have osseointegration. Okay, now ankylosis is different. When you put an evulse tooth in the mouse back, yes, we, we say it's ankylosed if you don't have periodontal ligament, if it, the periodontal ligament dies. And the problem is what is ankylosis? Ankylosis is that osteogenic cells are attracted by the root, by the cementum or dentin, they attach to it and they start to produce a matrix on it, okay? This way we have bone matrix, new bone matrix is exactly on the surface of the dentin or on cementum. This is we call ankylosis. This is a biological connection, okay, because we have dentin or cementum, bone matrix, cells. So this works together, it's functioning. Mm -hmm. okay. And because also we have to take into account, every dentist has to, to know that resorption is very fast. It takes two weeks, three weeks, sometimes you see a lot of resorption, formation, is very slow. You know, to build, to destroy a building is quickly. Mm -hmm. To build it takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. The same with bone. Okay. Now, if you have a scaffold which is resorbed very fast, the bone cannot match it. I mean, cannot form and match it. The, with the dentin, okay, or with allogenic even, 
membranous millized bone, which will be very slowly resolved, the replacement will immediately be at the same pace. Mm -hmm. So we need, when we're talking about the buckle plate, we need materials. And this is why I, I'm so, I mean, uh, even uh, excited that the dentin, especially the autogenic dentin, has those properties because it's recognized by our cells, it's mine, yes? So we have ankylosis, and then we have a very slow replacement resorption, like in ankylos teeth, which takes years. And even if you have lost the dentin, the root, still you have the bone. Mm, that's so, wonderful. I, I'm yeah. uh, Dr. Binderman. I'm I'm taking notes here, so uh, I'm I'm going back to 25 years ago. I'm, I don't know if I was the best student in class, but uh, I always took notes. So you are you are very very. Uh, by by your questions, I can see that you you know really the problems. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that, and uh, you know I also went to residency, so that helped too. Uh, That's right. So this in a good uh, school, I think. Thank Toronto? you, Toronto, Toronto U- University of Toronto. Yeah. So it sounds it sounds like, and I, I wanted to go back. It sounds yeah. like that the uh and you may may want to talk about that too uh that uh, dentin grafting at the moment seems to be an optimal bone graft material but before we talk about that you mentioned synthetic materials as being advantageous in some ways and c- could you talk about this for just one minute what are the options for uh synthetic and why are they advantageous the synthetic materials, because you can build or include in them materials that will uh, attract uh, the wound healing process properly. You know, uh, when I studied wound healing, you know, so it was only about the clotting. And the rest we didn't know how what are the, the importance of different cells changing in the wound healing? I think that if we want to understand grafting, we need to understand wound healing. And specifically, we, we only recently, I learned myself that the macrophage, that we all, all the time we think about him, that the cells, which is essentially very important in the inflammatory phase because it is eating up all the bacteria and toxins and all this. So it's like a scavenger for us cleaning the area. Okay. And then what? And we talk about stem cells. Wow. Stem cells. We need stem cells. No, we need to switch this macrophage. We call it an M1 macrophage, inflammatory macrophage, into a regenerative macrophage, which is called M2 macrophage. The M2 macrophage is bringing blood vessels, is bringing with the blood vessels perivascular cells. Mm. So if you need, for example, you graft it. You need blood vessels. Of course, first of all, this is our main problem and especially when we graft a lot of a scaffold. You will not get blood vessels if the M1 macrophage will not switch into M2 macrophage. Hmm. The how, M2 do we do, macrophage how do we do that? How do we do that? Okay. <laughs> because I came to it because they are synthetic materials. They do it. Because they don't have any kind of immune responses. And in synthetic materials, some do it, and some disturb it. Okay. So from our uh, like trials, we know, for example, that TCP is doing it. Okay. We know also, for example, today, bioglass. That's tricalcium phosphate, Dr. Binderman? Yes. Tri- beta tricalcium phosphate. 
Yes. Uh, Trichalcium. Why? Because it dissolves fast. And it's producing calcium ions. Calcium ions important because they are also not only they are mitogens, and they also are important to to activate the cells to become osteoblasts and produce uh, matrix. Okay. And on the other hand, we have also some materials like it's called bioglass. They mm -hmm. have silicium, and silicium uh, is also a bioactive material. The question is why they are bioactive. I will give you just my feeling. They bind from the blood clot fibrin fibronectin, the fiber, fibers. Okay. Fib fibrin and fibronectin, fibronectin from the plasma, fibronectin molecules just to those who are not in the literature, fibronectin is most important to bind cells biologically because it has some kind of a three amino acids, it's called RGD, that they bind some, some proteins from the, from the cells and when they bind together covalently, the cells start to be viable and active. Okay. okay. So the fibroactin, fibronectin, sorry, is very important. Now people believe that silicium is is binding the fibrin fibronectin very well, and therefore you have like a like in PRF, for example. Mm -hmm. Why PRF is good? Okay. Because it has a lot of macrophages, and it has also fibrin. At the we call it provisional matrix. Which macrophages? Which macrophages does the PRF have? Is it the M2 macrophages? No, it has, it has innocent macrophages at this point. M meaning what? Meaning what? Meaning that when they interact, okay. If you put, if you have a, a lot of graft, and let's say the grafting material has still some uh, problem, but some bacteria, okay. So if you have a very low amount of macrophages at the site, at the local site, yes, sometimes they cannot overcome and you get into a chronic uh, problem, okay, because the inflammatory phase is not over, okay. But if you bring to the area a lot of, fib uh, I mean, macrophages, they can overcome very fast the inflammatory process and they can then switch to the M2. Mm. To the regenerative. Okay. okay, that's this that's so interesting. Hmm? That's so interesting, and yeah. and thank yeah. you for thank but you for enlightening us. You see, but this is part of the wound healing process. Mm -hmm. Okay, why we need the PRF? You know, if you do a surgery on an eighteen-year boy or a girl, you don't need it. They have so active, and and uh, their immune cells are so active and good. But if you have a guy like me, yes, <laughs> okay, you need PRF. You need to help. Or if you have a diabetic patient, mm -hmm. yes, it's good to use PRF. And, and also a guy like me. Also a guy like me, because I'm getting there. Uh, Dr. Binderman, let's, let's switch gears a little bit and talk okay. clinically. talk clinically about... Dentin grafting. This is not something that was discovered yesterday. It's been, how many years has, has this been, been around? Well, dentin grafting essentially is more than 100 years around. Wow. Well, why? Mm -hmm. Because uh, myself, I, you know, I graduated, I don't want to, to mention now, but it's 63, <laughs> in 1963, okay? In 1986, we published a paper with some of, uh, of uh, dentists that uh, you are also familiar with, that we could take teeth and transplant them into a socket of extracted tooth. And we got, and we treated the, the transplanted teeth with fluoride to prevent very fast resorption of the roots. And with other medication like bisphosphonates, you can use to prevent it. Anyhow, and they lasted for eight years. Mm. They were ankylosed. Okay, 
So as I as I told before, yes, they were recognized ankylos. Ankylosis is the most important biological, uh, I mean, solution in grafting. Okay. So then coming for many years, uh, there are studies now, Malmgren and before him, that uh, used uh, ankylos teeth for any reason, traumatic and so on. They did decoronation and left the root, the whole root inside. Okay. And if you extract the tooth and you still have the root inside and it's not infected, the root will stay there and will slowly resolve, but it will not produce any problems with it. But it will maintain, the most important, it maintains because it's ankylos to bone and therefore it maintains it as we, saw, as we spoke before. Okay. Now, I would say I will give the credit of doing it in a, in a nice way to the South Koreans. They had like a system, a dentist was extracting a tooth, sending it to a bank. They did it, crushed it, uh, grinded it, and so on. It's important to, the particle size will be more than 200. And this is because if you put any kind of graft lower than 50 microns, the macrophage will uh, eat it and will become giant cells and so on. Is that the particle, is that the particle size? Yes. Mm. Yes. It's important that the particle size will be more than 200. This way you will switch the M1 to M2. And, okay. and, that's, and what, what are the units on that? 200 microns. Mi microns. microns. Micromillimeters is called. So it's a it's a volumetric a volumetric um, uh, unit. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a meter, micrometer. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So that's microns. Microns. Okay. Microns is um, one millionth of meter. So so for example, if we had to compare it to, let's say, conventional allograft, and we typically the uh, same. So, so it's the same, same particle yeah, size as a conventional thing. allograft material. You know, I, I will just make a point here about the particle size because it's important. Uh, many, I, I, had a, I had material, yes, a, a bioglass material uh, produced by a German company. Excellent, as I said, very good. I had a, an animal system which I could test very fast if they are active producing bone or not. And then they said, you know, I, I have now a syringe. Yeah, it's fantastic because the dentists love it to use the syringe. So I, I took the syringe and I did the same test. And I got a lot of giant cells, no bone. Although I used the same uh, bone marrow to, produce, to have osteogenesis. And I looked at the size of the particles and they were very tiny. Mm. So the macrophage have the sensors to identify. They know the surface. They know the, 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 the particle size. They try to engulf it. If they cannot, they said, okay, so I have to, so this is good substance. I, I have to, to make a material on it. I produce okay. bone. So, okay. so, we can, so we can extrapolate and I don't know if, if it's possible. Can we extrapolate that the same particle size or the same, the same uh, intention would be for other graft materials? So if you use very small particle size, it's actually a disadvantage. Disadvantage. Okay, great. So that's, that's a great clinical yes, tip. Very important. Okay, okay. Yes. Sometimes so, don't admit it, but this is a disadvantage. Okay, that, that, that's, that's great the to point know. Is that usually those... Small materials. I mean, they will they will give you a, a, the inflammatory phase will be prolonged. Mm. Okay, and you don't need it. Okay, thank you, thank you for it. that. Thank you for that. That's that's very now. Important if information. we come back to the dentin graph, yeah. Okay, of course, as we discussed it. So, if we can, and the problem with the dentin graph, the main problem which we had, I mean, which we developed is, you know, we extract, you extract the tooth, you cannot wait one week to get the, it 
a nice particulate to graft it back because the wound healing is not waiting for you. Mm -hmm. It's going, it, the pace is going, and you disturb it, it's a problem sometimes, right? Disturbing the wound healing. So this is why we developed this. And we had essentially one problem which we discussed was a particle size, and this was easy. Mm -hmm. The second problem was how to make it bacteria free, how to get rid of all the what is bound to the and and here we have an advantage in the dentin. What is the advantage in dentin? Also the same in membrane as bone. Then when the matrix, the osteoid or the or the matrix is mineralized, the mineral is protecting the organic material. This is essentially most important for the dentist because otherwise, if you would heat and this will not be protected, the organic, the, all the proteins will be degraded. Mm -hmm. Yes, because they, you deform them. So the mina is first of all protecting all the matrix. So all the problem in dentin is superficial. Okay, the bacteria are superficial. The plaque, whatever you have. So you can get rid of it easier. The problem in dentin is also that you have to get rid from the tubuli mm -hmm. to make clean the tubuli. And, and that's the, the dentinal, and that's the dentinal tubules that, that are basically tubule. infected. Essentially, yes. Uh -huh. okay. And this is what the cleanser, and I was thinking about many things, how to make a cleanser that will not be, you know, on one hand will be effective, but on the other hand, it may produce another toxic material inside brain. Mm. And this is why we came out with the simple cleanser, which is also bringing sodium, yes. And sodium we have in, <laughs> in our blood and everywhere, we need sodium, right? Uh, this is the saline, whatever, <laughs> yes. So it's not a problem, but it's very effective. It's cleaning fantastically. Okay, so, so this, this infection is not an issue. And, and, what, and what if there would be some bacteria in a socket? I mean, we know we're not working in a sterile environment. So what exactly. is the... You know, it's, it's the patient's bacteria. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a, in science a paper a year ago saying that the patient's bacteria are protecting him from other bacteria, from other people bacteria. Okay. 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 So it's important that we have a, a good bacteria. <laughs> great. Great. So so you solved the problem of uh, disinfection or the issue of disinfection was addressed. And so how does actually dentin grafting work? So let's walk me through a case where you extract a tooth all the way to the completion of the grafting procedure. If you can, in a in a clinical way, what would be the process? The, the, the process, you know, you first of all, you extract the tooth. And it's dirty, it has a calculus, it has... Sometimes you will look at the, this tooth and say, I get, get rid of it. You know, put in some material, which is detoxified. Okay. But if you take this tooth and you just, like, scale it, by a tung tungsten carbide for the surface, remove the calculus. It's, it takes one, two minutes. And you can also, not only you, you can, you auxiliary, you, your assistant can do it. Yes, and she will love to do it. And, uh, and then immediately you have a clean room, root, beautiful root, okay? Including the, ra the crown? Uh, including the coronal part? crown, because if you have a clean crown, if you don't have a, if you need to, to get rid of, for example, of the, of a, let me just, oh, if you get, you can get rid of, of a, a, some, a, a, if you have a crown, or if you have a filling, a, a composite, whatever, this you have to cut out, because okay. those are, uh, of course, material. But then you have, if you have a clean, and you have even, uh, even enamel, enamel is HA. 
It's mm -hmm. not inductive like dentin. It's not attracting the, the, the cells like dentin. Of course, it's a big deal, but it's also minor particles. It's like having hydroxyapatite. Okay. With TCP, for example. But here you have mostly. Then you have now a clean. You have to make it dry. And then you put a chamber. I think the the most important, our uh, I would say, uh, invention or what, or the novelty in this, is essentially the chamber. It comes sterile. You put the tooth inside, and as you have experience, in three seconds, you crush the tooth into particulate, and then you have a sieve that will select for you the essentially the right particle size which is above 250 microns mm -hmm. and if you you know i would say sometimes uh, dentists want to, to get rid of all the material in the chamber to get it down if you have some particle size two millimeters it's fine also if you can put it mm -hmm. you don't need to be on the upper side you don't have to be very I mean, keen about having get rid of all of it. Okay, so if I may interject for one second, the yes. So there are two chambers that we're using. So should we use the small particle size based on what we talked about before? Is there any advantage okay. or disadvantage? Yes. Now, uh, if you use it together, yes. If you use it by itself, no. Okay. So there's, okay, luckily in this, well, and we found the, the right timing of, uh, I mean, of, uh, of uh, grinding, yes? Uh, the three seconds, okay? Uh, if you grind for five seconds, you may get more, the ratio of the small particles will be larger. This is what okay. we found. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. You see, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're talking we about this. a lot this. of studies. <laughs> yes, thank you. And, and, and the questions I'm asking are really from um, a user's perspective because I use dentin grafting quite a bit in my practice, as you may know. Yes, I know. And I'm, I'm very happy with the results, but they're mostly clinical observations. And I had a couple more questions about uh, the dentin. So if we are missing the buckle plate or part of the buckle plate and we're intending to use a dentin graft we already talked about the fact that if we can avoid uh, damaging the papilla and the marginal tissue we should do that but yes. is there an advantage to use a collagen membrane or not hey, i i would put it this way in my practice when i practice dentistry I never used the uh, membranes. Wow. So I don't have experience. Mm -hmm. But I will give you some tip about the dentin. Okay? Okay. That we, I did some s studies. Now, there are people saying, you know, we use dentin, but we demonize it. Because the demonized dentin, okay, or decalcified, yes, remove the mineral. And have mm -hmm. only the matrix. Because the organic matrix has BMP, has collagen, and it's very, very active. And the mineral is essentially like protecting it. So it's, it's not as active as the demonized, mm -hmm. which is true. This is true. But as I said, when you use demonized dentin, then this demonized dentin, the whole matrix will disappear faster. Mm -hmm. So this and why? Is a, why? Why is why, that going to happen? You have in the area, uh, we call it MMPs, metalloproteinases. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Like which, are, which are what? Collagenases, for example. Yeah, right? they're degraded. And mm -hmm. also, you know, how mm -hmm. much a growth factor will stay after demonization before it's gone? inactivated seconds wow seconds. Yes. seconds seconds if it does not attach to a receptor it's gone okay that's so that people that's talking about 
you know, TGF, BMP. Okay. It, it takes, if you, if you, the BMP which is released is not released sequentially, slowly, mm. it's, it's, or immediately everything is released, it's gone. Okay. okay. So this is so why I'm mentioning it. I'm mentioning it because when you have and you want to restore the buckle plate, and this is important, and you want it also, the dentin, to attach to the periosteum and interact with it, okay? I would suggest to demilize, but for a very short period of time. We demilize it for two minutes, one to two minutes only. After the cleanser, we remove the cleanser, yes? We add some EDTA, 10% EDTA, which we, we make up, and, and you can get it also. For two minutes, remove the EDTA, wash it with PBS, which you have, okay? And then you go and you graft it. Okay. Now you expose much more molecules, proteins, which are attracting periosteum interact and you will get much better more i would say more connectivity with the bone and with the with other dentin and i think this way we we may really produce buckle plate and not being resolved fast why because most of the particles are still mineralized Okay. It's only the 10 microns of the surface. So this is, this is the... This is novel. Oh, this is novel. So this is not yeah. the protocol that is currently utilized. So there's right. no... Right. The difference is... This is for experts like you that have already experienced a lot. Okay. Or so somebody this... that is experienced and wants to now to a little bit more, like mm -hmm. you said, I would like... I can... Yes, I think the dentin is today the most valid uh, tool to even to build a buckle plate and preserve and, it. And the difference, Dr. Binderman, is that the step of partial or short-term demineral demineralization, that's the, yes. that's the difference. Yes. And that has a better chance as opposed yes. to complete demineralization. Yes. Okay. You will have also the particles will also stick to each other. Okay. Now, and our time is almost up, but I, I have so many questions for you. So maybe we should do a part two. I, I would love to have another conversation, but maybe to finish off, is there an advantage of mixing the dentin graft with PRF? Yeah, it, it is an advantage, you know. You take two golds, you mix it together, they mix very well, mm -hmm. okay? If you take another metal and you mix with gold, it's not the same, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, of course, each one, because we, if you want to attract uh, the, the dentin with immediate regen uh, or a short-term uh, an inflammatory phase and go to the regenerative phase because we have to understand and uh, that there is an interaction between the macrophages, the regenerative macrophages and the young cells because the regenerative macrophages bring blood vessels hmm. surrounded by perivascular, some call them pericytes. They are very active in producing bone in the bone environment, okay? So when you have your PRF, PRF also is making sticky bone, which you call, so you can mold it. So if you want to make a buckle plate in a, in a geometry that you need, it also help, helps you very much. Okay. Okay, Dr. Binderman, this was, an, an amazingly valuable conversation. Thank you so much. In about 
uh, half an hour. We talked about uh, so many important topics, uh, like the importance of the free gingival margin in the papilla in the regenerative potential of our sockets. Uh, we talked about, uh, you know, why does the buccal plate resorb so much versus the lingual and the and the uh, palatal plates, uh, which are more uh, basal, uh, more basal bone. We talked about the advantage of dentin grafting. And for me, the highlight really of this conversation, except for reuniting with you after 25 years. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> my highlight was the M2 macrophage. And now in our mind as dentists, as practicing dentists, we think about macrophages as evil. And, right. <laughs> and, and, and now, with, now in, in that sense, and uh, converting the M1 into M2 uh, sounds like that is going to give us a lot of hope. So on that note, uh, Dr. Binderman, thank you very, very much for your thank you. uh, precious time and allowing me to have this conversation with you. I know we'll talk uh, many times more. Uh, I'll keep using the dentin graft. I'll keep posting cases and keep educating dentists all over the world on what we can do with socket grafting. Uh, any final words uh, to dentists all around the world? Well, I, I would say there is no one technique, okay? In my experience, I would put it this way. I had the opportunity to do both basic science and clinical work. And being one of the pioneers of implantology, was it, I started at the time that at the same time I worked at the Weizmann Institute in very basic problems of bone formation. As a matter of fact, we were the first to show bone formation culture. And by the way, I have a paper with, the, with the, one of our scientists, uh, Katsir who was also the president of Israel, Ephraim Katsir. Okay. <laughs> One of the first papers, by the way. Sure. But the message is that you have to take all the time to, take, to learn from the research, bring it to the clinic, and the clinical, real, real clinical questions, how we can answer them. It's very tough, but we learn every day more and more. And of course, not only in then from other research, we learn how we can also implement it in, in the clinical work in that. I don't believe in research just for ah fun. I like the research that can answer some clinical work. And this is what I enjoy to doing it. Okay. Thank you very much for your time and I look forward to talking to you and seeing you again.